On the show this week, we head out to Dholavira, the seat of the ancient Indus Valley civilization. We test out the new Honda Accord Hybrid and try our hands on the all-electric Mahindra E20+. We have been on a quest to rediscover India's history and culture on the Seven Wonders Drive. With the Maruti Suzuki Ertiga SHVS by our side, we have connected the Taj Mahal in Agra, Nalanda ruins in Bihar, the Sun Temple in Odisha, the ruins of Hampi in Karnataka, and the Ajanta Caves in Maharashtra. On this leg of our journey, we travel from Ajanta into Gujarat, our destination being the ancient seat of Harappan civilization. Roads to Surat are dual carriageways, though we saw evidence of four-laning work in progress up to the Gujarat border. Crossing over, NH53 turned into a beautiful four-lane highway all the way to Surat. Here is where we have another pro tip for travellers. Always stop and ask for directions. We didn't. Choosing to rely on maps navigation to our hotel and ended up at a dead end. Ah, dead end. Not once, but twice. Thanks to the rains and our detours, the Ertiga was begging for a cleaning. And not surprisingly, we found a Maruti Suzuki service center five minutes from our hotel on the outskirts of Surat. After a half hour of rigorous attention, the Artiga looked like it had just strolled off the showroom floor. We could have made the 650 kilometer trip to Dhalavira in one shot, given that roads are brilliant. Instead, we planned to stop for the night since accommodation around Dhalavira is scarce. So our stop for the night would be Dharan Gadra, about 250 kilometers short of Dhalavira. From there, it's a relatively short drive to one of the northernmost points of Gujarat, just a few kilometers from the Pakistan border. On the other hand, we were tempted to take a very long detour down the east-west corridor to explore the hidden gems of the northeast. You could drive all the way to Silchar and Assam on this very stretch of road. On the approach to Dhalavira, we found ourselves in the middle of the run of Kutch. At any other time, it would have been pristine white salt on either side. But now, it was shimmering blue water as far as the eye could see. Kilometers of nothingness stretching away in either direction, it made the experience of visiting one of the earliest sites of civilization even more surreal. Dhalavira is one of the best examples of Harappan civilization, better known to you and me as the Indus Valley civilization. The other discovered sites of the Indus Valley civilization include Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, both in Pakistan. To say there isn't much of the usual touristy stuff at Dhalavira would be an understatement. The only sign of life is a tourist centre which will offer you a home-cooked meal and maybe a room if you're lucky.
The excavated site is massive, so a trip to the adjacent museum beforehand helps you understand the significance of every bit of brick sticking out of the ground. Figurines, pottery, beads, jewellery and even a precise system of weights that have been unearthed are on display here. Especially fascinating is the unified system of weights, the smallest of which corresponds to 50 grams. It's likely the weights were used for trading purposes or for collecting taxes. Here were the ruins of a civilization with town planning that can put modern cities to shame, literally in the middle of nowhere. The engineering shown in water harvesting is staggering, with several dams, drains and reservoirs incorporated in the town planning. Dhalavira remains one of the best model cities of Indus times, showing the seven significant stages of culture. While we enjoyed the fact that Dhalavira isn't overpopulated, we feel it deserves more attention. Even the guides here offer a half-hearted sales pitch from under the comfort of a shady pagoda. Our final leg of the journey is coming up. In many ways, it proved to be the most challenging, with traffic jams coming in many shapes and sizes. Flooded roads in the desert state of Rajasthan and the beauty of the Golden Temple at night. Catch the next episode of Auto Today for the final part of the Seven Wonders Drive. Honda Accord has been one of the world's best-selling sedans throughout its generation. Now, India has love relationship with this car, you could say. When it came out, it was one of the best-selling D-segment sedans in India. It took a brief hiatus around 2012, but now the current 9th gen car is in India. And while it's been introduced globally in 2013, this car comes to India as a hybrid. And what that means is you get an engine, which is a 2-litre IVTEC petrol, and you get an electric motor and battery pack in the back. Combined, this car is set to give 23.1 kmpl in our Indian driving condition. Now, we've managed to spend a little bit of time with the car, so we can tell you how it feels on the highway, not too much how it feels like in the city. The Accord Hybrid looks futuristic while presenting a pleasant throwback to the generations that came before it. The face of the car is dominated by the large single strip chrome grille that flows into the active LED headlights. It's almost like the headlights are all reflectors lined just by the DRLs. It looks like something out of a sci-fi movie, further expressed by the scooped out air dams and fog light area seemingly floating at either end of the bumper thanks to the middle blacked out section. In profile, the sharp shoulder line provides the high point under which the sides dip down. The roof line terminates quite nicely at the boot lid, rimmed by a smart spoiler while the LED tail lights round out the rear. Coming to the interiors, the immediate feel is positive with the dual tone cabin presenting a mix of leather surfaces, plastic textures and wood grain veneers. The instrumentation will be familiar to most current Honda owners but with a suitably futuristic twist. Look at the large central speed of flank by displays for the state of the battery and fuel tank on the right and driving mode on the left. The dashboard has two tiers with the top tier housing a screen that Honda likes to call the Intelligent Multi-Information Display or I 
MID, which supplements the 7 inch touchscreen below. The seats are large and comfortable, while the rear bench offers substantial thigh support. Rear leg room is similarly impressive though. While sat at the rear, we wished we at least had air conditioning controls for the two rear vents. The Accord Hybrid is powered by a 2.0 liter iVTEC engine that produces a peak output of 145 bhp in conjunction with an electric motor. The combined output is 215 bhp and the part is transmitted to the road by an electronic CVT transmission. Honda claims a 23.1 km per liter overall fuel efficiency in the Indian cycle with this power terrain. After you reach a certain speed or when you, you press the throttle down enough, the 2 litre engine kicks in alive to assist with power. The transmission is an electronic CVT which is said to give smoother shifts and better fuel economy compared to a traditional CVT. Now unfortunately we haven't been able to drive the car enough in city traffic to verify that. But so far shifts are what you would expect from a regular CVT. The transition from the electric to petrol and back is seamless. Three out of five times my passenger thought we were still in EV mode while we were in fact running on good old petrol power. That speaks volumes for the refinement of the engine. Also for the excellent NVH package of the car that includes active noise cancellation. What is pleasantly surprising is that speeds are achieved easily and quickly. We even saw 140 km per hour on a short stretch. Bringing things to a halt with assurance are disc brakes front and back. Though the initial bite from the pedal feels a little springy, no doubt thanks to regenerative braking. Ride quality as experienced from the front seat and the back seat is flush, yet with what we feel to be firm damping. This combined with a reassuringly weighed steering should mean taking the long way back home is met with some enthusiasm. It isn't easy to pinpoint the forte of the Accord Hybrid. It's a great looking car, offering an elegant option for the conservative shopper with just the right amount of futuristic detailing to make it stand out. The hybrid tech it uses is cutting edge but we feel the car should have offered a few more goodies for the rear passengers like AC controls and sun blinds for the windows. In the end, potential customers will probably be swayed by the excellent refinement of the power terrain and the superbly comfortable ride. We've got something special for you on the Auto Today show this time around. Special not because of its performance or horsepower or torque or any of those things. This is a car that has no tailpipe and that's because it's electric. This is the Mahindra E20 Plus with zero tailpipe emissions obviously. But that's not the biggest thing about this car. The main draw of this car is actually something that Mahindra Electric claims their customers have been asking for for a really long time and that's the addition of the rear door. It even has two of them. Another welcome byproduct is the more cohesive overall look of the car. The E2 Plus benefits from having more traditional and thus pleasing proportions. Take for example the front grille. Though the headlights remain the same, the new Mahindra family grille gives the car a more, well, car-like look. The rear sees the most change and as a result loses some of the quirky funkiness of the earlier E20, while getting a good amount of seriousness in terms of proportions. Most importantly, the tailgate now stretches down to the bumper so you can conveniently access the 135 litre boot space. Good for two small suitcases and just slightly smaller than a hatchback like the Alto's boot. Going back to the interior space, there's lots of it and the large class area helps. Things remain 
largely the same as on the Eto, but just a few key differences. The seats are still very comfortable. On this P8 top end variant, you get uh, leather seats with a very nice pattern. You also get a new uh, fascia around the dash insert with a new design. The 6.2 inch touchscreen still offers the excellent functionality that it did before, including GPS and the status of your car and the charging. Uh, a point worth mentioning is the seats themselves, or rather where they're placed. Because the operated back tea pack is under the front seats, the seats feel a little high up. Despite that, there is good headroom. So for me, I'm 5'11", there is still a decent amount of headroom. Our camera person, though, is about 6'1", and he felt headroom was a little lacking. The instrumentation is carried over from the E2O since it was already ahead of the curve in terms of information and presentation. You get clear readouts for the state of charge, distance remaining and current efficiency apart from the regulars. Standout features are the start-stop button, keyless entry and smartphone control. The lack of the sound of an engine is the first thing that strikes you, but there are various other sounds that the car makes which you kind of pick up on. The main being the AC. So I'm going to turn the AC on now. Let's hope you can pick that up. That's the sound of the AC on the first blower speed. That's the second, that's the third, that's the fourth, that's the fifth, that's the sixth. I don't even know if you can hear me now. So. It, these are small things, but I think the, the sound just gets amplified because there's no sound of the engine. The, the ride is good, and when I say good, I mean that it can handle the bumps, but when it comes to speed breakers, the rear just feels like it's jumping. Also, like we're just coming to an uphill section right now, the difference between the forward mode of the gearbox and the boost mode of the gearbox is pretty huge. Like with your foot press, it's especially apparent. The quality of plastics is decent for this class of car, but there are a few rough edges, like the inner areas of the door handles. A slight ergonomic issue arises from the B pillar being situated slightly behind the front seats, so you have to turn right around to grab the seat belt and buckle up. Another few oddities are the elastic band bottle holder and speakers mounted at the foot that affect sound quality from the otherwise impressive Blowpunk infotainment system. The Eto Plus is available in four variants, with the top P8 variant that we drove getting the most powerful motor, 91 Newton meter torque and 40 bhp. The 210 ampere hour battery remains the same on all variants. The range of the P8 standing at 140 km, while the P2, P4, P6 are rated at 110 km. What all these numbers translate to is zippy performance, especially after slotting the direct drive transmission into boost mode. Just before setting off, there is one little quirk about the e Plus that you will immediately notice and that's yeah, the seat belt isn't where you expect it to be, so it's a little bit of a reach behind you. But not a deal breaker by any means. After driving about 20 km and running the car with the AC and infotainment on for 6 hours, the battery dropped about 40%. We were sure a driver without lead in his feet would be able to come close to the claimed range. Charging from a regular plug point takes 9 hours for a full battery. If that sounds long, Mahindra Electric will install a high power 10 kilowatt charger at your residence at a cost of about 5 lakh rupees that will get the job done in an hour and a half. The e Plus seems to have addressed the main perceived issue with the E2O, the convenience trade-off for a green mode of transport. With the rear doors and great rear bench space, 
you can have a city car that will serve the needs of a typical family too. The added range and power of top spec variant is a topping on the eco-friendly K. Triumph India expanded their vulnerable range with the launch of the all-new T100 at a starting price of Rs 7.78 lakh. The all-new Bonneville T100 was recently unveiled at Intermode 2016 and will be placed between the Street Twin and Bonneville T120 in India. The all-new T100 also gets a black variant and takes inspiration from the 1959 Bonneville. Ashok Leyland has launched the Circuit, the first made-in-India electric bus. It has a minimum seating capacity of 35 to a maximum of 65 and can run up to 120 km on a single charge under standard test conditions. The bus will cost between Rs 1.50 crore to 3.50 crore. 60% of the cost of the bus is because of the batteries as they are imported from the US. German car maker BMW has launched the 2016 BMW 3 Series Gran Turismo in India at a base price of Rs 43.30 lakh. The new car will be available in three trims. The Sport Line Diesel, which is the base model, the Luxury Line Diesel, which will be available for Rs 46.50 lakh, and the Luxury Line Petrol, which is available for Rs 47.50 lakh. The interiors have also been spruced up slightly with a little more chrome and wood making its way into the cabin. Your smartphone can even be connected to the car's external aerial through an inductive tray. Jaguar has launched the first SUV, the F-Pace, today in India. Starting at a base price of Rs 68.4 lakh, the top-end variant has been priced at Rs 1.12 crore. The F-Pace is offered with a 2.0-litre, 4-cylinder, turbocharged Ingenium diesel engine producing 177 bhp of peak power and 430 nm of torque, while the 3.0-litre V6 turbocharged diesel engine will produce 296 bhp and 700 nm of torque. Visually inspired by the F-Type, the all-new Jaguar F-Pace is a performance SUV that has a DNA of a sports car. Its powerful and agile look makes it utterly distinctive and gives it a head-turning road presence. From the bonnet bulge to the pronounced rear haunches, the all-new F-Pace reinvents the energy, strength and purity of form of the F-Type.